Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm so glad that you are here for our last presentation of the season, our last parent chat. It's always kind of a, a sad ending, like to say, okay, we're like done for the year, um, but ew, we have to get ready for summer. We have to get prepared. Um, can somebody let me know if everything is showing up okay, the video and everything? Um, sometimes I don't see everything on this end. Um, just let me know you can hear me, you can see me so we can get started. Um, as I mentioned, this is Parent Chat. This is funded by the Lake Washington Schools Foundation. And we are so thrilled to be able to have Parent Chat ongoing. We just had a conversation the other day. Are we gonna do this next year too? We're gonna do this next year. So um, before you leave today, if you can put in the chat box, different topics that you think we really need to cover. Um, I would love to hear that. We are always looking for suggestions um, as I'm preparing for the next season of Parent Chat. For those of you who have not attended before, I'm Coach Sherry. I'm the founder of a company called TeenWise, but I'm here today as a volunteer for The Balance in Mind. And this is a group that was created to help bring mental health resources to the parents in our community, because we were realizing that with all of the stuff that's going on with our kids, um, we need to be part of the mix of learning and figuring out how to best support our kids. So that's why I'm here tonight with you. And um, we're gonna be talking about communication, which is obviously key to supporting your kid, no matter what they're going through, we have to be able to communicate with them. So let me pull up my slides and share those. And, um, then we will get started. Let me make sure I'm pulling up the right one. Here we go. So calm communication. And we're gonna talk about, of course, it, we named this webinar like having deep conversations and calm, calm, calm communication and deep conversations, meaningful conversations go hand in hand. So uh, this is it's really important for us as parents to show up in a way that our kids know they can trust that we're going to be calm, that we're going to be supportive, and that we're going to be there for them as they go through the crazy ups and downs, as they make some choices that are not so great. We have to make sure that we are calm and ready for anything that comes our way. So we're going to talk about some basic ideas and then we're going to talk about some specifics so that you walk away today with some really concrete ideas of how to foster calm communication in your home. Um, I really love to have more interactive. So if you have questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A box. If you have comments or thoughts that come up, feel free to put those in the chat box and I will be watching those. Um, June is here also supporting and she'll be watching as well. Normally for those of you who attend, I'm the facilitator, not the presenter. So today I'm kind of doing both. So um, we will be watching those together though. All right, so let's get started. First, I want to say that um, I have a company called TeenWise, right? But I work with parents of all ages, and I work with kids ages eight all the way up actually to 23. So um, if your child isn't a teen, don't worry, this stuff is still very relevant. So if I say teen or I'm talking about, you know, teen stuff, just know that, you know, think of it in terms of the younger years. I'm going to be talking about both. But just if I'm saying teen, don't think, oh, that's not relevant for me. And if you're here and you don't have teens yet, just know that some of the stuff we're talking about is going to prepare you. A lot of times when I'm talking to parents of teens, they'll say afterwards, I wish I would have known this earlier. So if you have those younger kiddos, you're in the right space. First thing I want to ask of all of you is to either close your eyes or look down at the ground. I'm going to have you visualize something that's going to get you in the right mind space here. I want you to think about when you were about 12. If you have younger kids, you can think of yourself in, that, in those younger years. Whatever works for you, I want you to kind of get in the space of where your kids are, but I want you to think of yourself. So think about yourself when you were like 12 years old, whatever age you're choosing, and think about what you were wearing. What was your like favorite go-to outfit? Now add to that picture your parents or your guardians. Where were they? How did they dress? Think about that, like get specific. And they're probably around the age that you are now, 
So think of them in that kind of time frame. Now I want you to think about the conversations that you had with them, or maybe that you didn't have with them. What were they about when you did interact with your parents? And how did they make you feel? I want you to just take a moment, like 10 seconds. I want you to jump back into that time frame, and I want you to think about this. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds of silence here. Okay, for some of you, you might have had some fond, warm, fuzzy memories pop up. For others, you might have had some not so great memories pop up, maybe some more negative interactions. Um, when you're acting, when you're interacting with your kids, what I want you to think about is what you were just visualizing what you remember those interactions were like. Now I want you to think about what did you need in those moments, in those times, what was it? Did you feel scared and alone sometimes? Did you feel isolated? Did you feel your parents' support? Do you wish you had had more support? And if so, what was that support like that you wanted, that you were like craving? And did you crave those moments of approval and really loathe the moments of disapproval when your parents weren't approving of you or your behaviors. And then moving forward, remember this moment, what you're thinking about now. If you're having a difficult time making choices as a parent, close your eyes. Think back to you at that age and what did you need? If you're thinking about your 12 year old self, what did your 12 year old self need? because that's what your kids need and want from you. Doesn't matter, they're going through different things these, these uh, days. This generation has some extra challenges they're going through, but all in all, they still need the same things. Now, sometimes in our parenting, especially in the teen years, right? But even in the, with those young ones, our conversations can begin to get a little bit heated, a little bit volatile. Um, as you and your kids kind of butt heads around rules in the household or things that are going on. So it's just them exerting their independence and figuring out who they are and how they kind of relate to the world around them, what their values are, what their opinions are. And it can be a bumpy road at times when they don't line up with your values and opinions. And this can happen at a very young age, right? If you're saying, I want you to wear this shirt and they're saying no, it can get bumpy already and get emotional. And when it, you fast forward to the teen years, it just gets more volatile and more bumpy because they're kind of, they look like a miniature adult and you kind of start to see them a little more like an adult. So there's different types of interactions, which leads to a lot of friction. Now we as parents, we can get really stubborn. Like we think of our kids as stubborn sometimes, but we are stubborn too. We can get wrapped up in our cause. Like we have a cause and we're gonna win. And instead of having a conversation, instead of talking about how they're feeling or what they want or how they see things, we get in the mode of we are going to win, whatever that means. Our adrenaline gets pumping, our hearts get going, our emotions rev up, and we vow to get our opponent to the ground at all costs. Not literally, of course, metaphorically, but it becomes like this wrestling match almost. And, and we don't even know what the wrestling match is about anymore. We just know that we want to win. And as parents, often that means we want to control, and that control often comes from fear of some sort. Now, what we really want to work towards is something like this, right? A conversation that leaves us and our kids smiling and the feeling of being heard and listened to and respected. Now, it doesn't always mean we're going to end up like this, where everybody is smiling, because it doesn't mean that we always get what we want as parents. Our kids aren't always going to listen. It certainly doesn't mean that our kids are going to get everything that they want. That's for sure. 
But so we wanted, what we want to do is we want to work on not necessarily getting everyone smiling, but we want to make sure that at the end of our conversations, that we feel heard and respected and our kids feel heard and respected. That's what we're working towards when we're working towards calm communication and deep conversations. It doesn't mean we're always going to be in agreement. It doesn't mean everybody's going to be smiling, but we feel heard and respected. All right, and make sure if you have any questions, feel free to ask those, okay. All right, we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you, I always like to give some specific things that you can walk away and think about. And so we're going to talk about a conversation formula. So emotions can get pretty big in the teen years. They can get really big in the elementary years and in the adult years. Emotions are big, but in the teen years, the amygdala takes over. So the emotions are bigger, right? But if you have a younger one, you know that those emotions can get big then as well. And if they're really young, you know, we talk about the terrible twos, they can't really articulate what's wrong and those emotions get really big. If we think about teens, we think they can articulate everything they can talk to us right unlike a two-year-old has limited vocabulary but the thing is if you start asking them about how they feel and why they feel that way they can't necessarily articulate that so we have to kind of modulate ourselves keep ourselves calm so that we can support our kids right now there is some research done that when our kids hit puberty they actually react to us in a very different way they see us as a threat which puts them into the fight or flight so we are up against that so when we talk about being calm to have these good conversations we really have to be calm because our kids see us as mad already that's when you say like you call their name and they're like what 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 did i do what do you want it's because they're already in that kind of fight or flight. So we have to work really hard to um, kind of combat that, if you will. Um, we also have to think about like the, the emotions as they're going all over the place. We need to think about, are we reacting to their emotions? When their emotions get big, it's very easy for us because we're very close to our kids to kind of try to get in sync with those emotions. Our bodies try to do that. So we have to work to stay calm even when they're going like this, even when they yell, even when they're saying, I hate you, we have to keep ourselves regulated and stay more logical. So we're going to do that by sticking to a formula, listen, digest, and respond. If you can type that in the chat box, that would be great. It's going to help you to remember it. And it lets me know that somebody is actually out there. Now I'm going to have to take breaks tonight. I will let you know I've had, I've been um, getting over some cold stuff. So I'm gonna to have to make sure I'm hydrating myself so I can keep talking this whole time. Thank you, thank you for putting that in. I like it, LDR. Keep it short and simple, right? Very cool. Okay, so listen, we're gonna talk about listen. This is the first part of the formula. And if you've ever heard me talking about conversations with kids, teens, you know that this is a really big thing I talk about a lot. And this is the most important. So if you can't remember, digest and respond, just remember, listen, um, just take that from tonight and um, it's gonna take you leaps and bounds further in having these calm conversations with your kids. So there really is a big difference between listening and hearing. So it's very important that we talk about listening to our kids. We can hear noises all day long. If you stop and listen for a moment, um, there's things around you in your room right now that you're not aware of the sounds. They're just happening. Your brain's not interpreting them. It might be the humming of a fan or it might be a dog barking outside. You're not actively listening to those. They're just happening and coming into your brain. So when we're listening to our kids, we need to be actively listening, not just like having them over here chattering to the side. We want to actually engage and listen. So one of the things to consider is what are the distractions that are in the way of you listening to your kids? These are the same distractions that are in the way of your kids listening to you. And you probably have some extras in there too. So I want you to pop into the chat box some things in your life that are distractors when you're trying to listen to your kids. Electronics should definitely be in there somewhere, right? Might be computer, might be phone, um, 
might be just music in general. Um, TV, other kids, yes, absolutely. Other kids is a big one. That is really hard when you have more than one child that is vying for your attention, right? Especially if it's after school hours, right? Lots of stuff is going on. How do you make time to listen to one child when you've got others? And what I would recommend you do, if there's one child talking and someone comes up, say, look at them and say, just one second, I'm listening to, to Tony. Or just one second, I'm listening to Sheila. Because what it says to that person you're listening to, you are really important and I am concentrating on you. And what it also shows this other child who wants your attention, I'm going to come back to you. So you can say, just one minute, I'll talk to you in a minute. And, you know, we can't control the reactions of our kids, but we're showing them a pattern and we're showing them that it's important to listen to people. All right. Um, to do list, that is a big one, such a big one. And the to do list is one of those that, even if you're not doing that to do list, it's running through your mind. If your kid is telling you something, you're like, oh, but I've got to do this and this and this and this. Um, then you're not listening, right? And we, this is no judgment, by the way, we all are up against this, right? So we have to be very purposeful when it's time to listen. Work situations, yes, definitely. Um, the clock, dinner plans, um, my own thoughts, yes, my own thoughts, that's such a good one. And your own thoughts often come in, whether it's about a to-do list or situations, sometimes the thoughts are about what your child is saying. And those thoughts that can come in are about what do I need to say? What do I need to do? So if you can postpone figuring out what your response is and just listen, it's going to change things for you. And you're going to be able to listen, not just to their words. You're going to be able to listen to their emotions, notice their body language better. So you get the whole picture instead of just the words. So there was this article that I read, um, when I read it, it just it really hit home. It was about this nine-year-old girl, and they were asking a lot of kids about electronics and their parents and stuff. And this nine-year-old girl had gone on a ski trip with her dad. What a great situation, right? Spending time with dad on the ski slopes. But her takeaway was that she felt like she was too boring to keep his interest because he would keep getting on his phone, even when they were on the ski lift which is really sad, right? What was happening was the dad probably had a work situation or maybe was putting in a to-do list or texting someone. But the daughter didn't say, oh, my dad's so busy. The daughter said, I am too boring to keep his interest. So we have to think about that as our devices get in the way of listening. Um, what is the message that we're sending to our kids? All right, the second part, digest. Listen, digest, and respond. So digest means we're thinking about what's going on in the situation. Um, digesting what they're saying is not always a big thing. If you're just talking about something that's frivolous, lighthearted, you don't need to think really hard before you respond. But sometimes the conversations get a little bit dicey, a little bit heated. You're not really sure about the parenting tactic you should take or what your response should be. That means it's best to digest it before you say anything. So if let's say it's a big thing that's going on, you want to be very purposeful before you respond, which is the third piece, right? So digesting means kind of, you know, think about when you eat a big Subway sandwich, right? It's sitting in your stomach for a while, churning around. That's what we wanna do when our kids come to us with some big stuff. We wanna kind of let it churn around before we give either a consequence or advice or um, even a response sometimes. Sometimes we gotta just like stop before we say anything. Um, so in some situations, it might be something kind of big, like maybe your daughter comes and says, mom, dad, I'm failing a class. That conversation could be a short one like, oh, honey, we know you've been trying and this is a really hard class. It might be, I know you've been up until two in the morning playing video games every night. We need to talk about what we're gonna do about this, how we can support you through this. Uh, there was a book I read a while back called The Shadow of the Banyan Tree. And in that book, the I believe it was a grandmother told the granddaughter 
to chew on her tongue or twist her tongue like seven times before she responded. Um, I like the concept of that. It just meant like have something that makes you stop and think and digest before you respond. So for you, think about what that would be. It might be two big breaths. It might be clenching your fists a few times. It might be tapping on the table a few times. Have something that is your go-to. And this, again, this is for when things are bigger and when you feel like you're just gonna lose it. And especially if you are like super stressed out, your temper is gonna be much shorter. You wanna have this go-to in place so that you will digest and get yourself calm before you take the next step, which is to respond. Right, so we've got listen, we've got digest, now we get to respond. So this is last but not least, it's that we have to respond so that the other person in the conversation knows we're a part of this conversation, right? I mean, this seems really obvious, right? But we could just be there blank, not say anything. And that person is gonna be like, mom or dad's not listening to me at all. And the key here is that the word is respond, not react, right? Reacting means that it's just like an emotional response. It's not thought out. It's just like something we blurred out. It's kind of like just throwing up these words. Um, the reactions are typically fueled by emotions. And when we yell, what is behind that yelling? It's the emotion, right? Usually frustration, feeling ignored, feeling not listened to. That's when we yell. If you've asked your kids six, seven, eight, ten times to um, put their laundry away, sometimes on that tenth time you yell, and that comes back to that emotion that's underneath it. So we have to kind of think about we want to respond, and we want to be fairly consistent that we're responding, not reacting when our kids come to us, because then they learn to trust that mom and dad are safe people to go to. Mom and dad are not gonna explode. Mom and dad are gonna be calm and supportive. No matter what craziness I've gotten myself into, they are going to be calm. So that's why we have to work really hard to respond and not react. The other thing that happens if we react to something, what is gonna happen for our kids? they respond their emotions are triggered and they're going to respond really with heightened emotions or they're going to withdraw they're going to get small they're going to say nothing they're going to go to their bedroom and slam the door and that then is a disconnection which takes you away from working towards that calm com communication and that great deep conversation that you really want right so we have to think in this response, we have to think about being purposeful, being productive. What is it that we want out of the conversations with our kids? Many times, especially if we're in fear mode or if we're unsure of ourselves or if we're upset with our children's choices, we get into the control mode. And that control mode becomes a reaction, not a response. And our kids feel that when we're parenting from a place of control and fear, they feel that and they stop wanting to come and talk to us. So I want you to think about a time when you with your kids, all of us have done this, no judgment, when you reacted instead of responded. Give me like a thumbs up or something if you've ever been in that situation. And I'm asking you to do this so we know we can support each other and know we've all been there. We have had times where we have reacted and not responded. Yes, I see those thumbs coming up and I would put my own up there. Um, definitely, I've, I've had that happen. Now think back to that time when you reacted instead of responded. Were you like, oh my gosh, that was a great parenting moment. I am so glad I reacted like that. That was so wonderful. Probably not. Usually when we react instead of respond, we have that after effect of, oh, I feel like I, I didn't handle that well, or we really go down the path of judging ourselves and like, oh, I'm a horrible parent. Um, I'm never going to get this right. You know, all those spiraling inner critic things can be popped up. 
But so what I want you to remember as we're talking about these things, it's not about judgment, it's about awareness and about getting some new tools so we can do things in a different way, right? All right. Okay, listen, I just respond. Okay, now one thing I wanted to bring up today, it's um, this, the next concept here we're gonna go into is based on a book called Super Communicators. And one of the things that we as parents often do is we have a conversation that's different than the conversation our kid is having. And Super Communicators was not a parent teen book, um, but it is something that is relevant to any conversation in your life that you're having. We have to make sure we're having the same conversation, the same type of conversation that the other person is having. This is usable, not just as a parent, whoever you're talking to, whether it's at work, whether it's a teacher you're conversing with, whether it's your spouse or a friend, we need to keep this in mind. So I wanna go through these three types and talk about this from a parenting point of view. What conversation are we typically having when our kids are having a different one? So the first type of conversation is the to-do conversation, the practical conversation. When your kid comes to you and they've had a tough day, maybe they've had friendship issues, maybe they failed a test, they're coming to you to talk about it in one way. And us as parents, we often go straight to the practical side of it. If our kid comes and says, I'm failing a class, what do we do? Talk about, do you need a tutor? Do you want me to help you? We talk about the to do, the practical. And that's part of what we have to talk about with our kids, but it's typically not the first type of conversation that they're coming to you for. So think about this also, if somebody like a spouse maybe comes to you, tells you about their, their work was a crappy work day and you start talking about who are you gonna talk to? Can you tell your boss, how are you gonna fix it? They're like, I just wanna tell you about my bad day but you're in to-do practical mode. So what it does is you think I'm helping, I'm being great, I'm giving advice. It's a disconnect because you're having different conversations. It's like you're in one room and the person you're talking to is the other. So we have to tune in to what type of conversation they're having. The second type is the feeling conversation. How are you? How is the person that is coming to you and talking to you? This is quite often with teens, especially, and with little kids. This is the conversation they're coming to you for. There's emotions involved. So they need to talk it out because they're not feeling great about what just went down, no matter what it is. So if it's the emotional conversation they're having, we get to listen. We get to let them vent. We don't have to talk about fixing it. We don't have to talk about what steps they're going to take. We listen and let them get through the emotional piece of it. Then we might hop back over to the to-do, the practical side. Now, the third type of conversation, and this is another piece that is very much involved when we are supporting our kids. It's the, who are they? How do they fit into the world? Are they an academic scholar? Are they a good friend? Are they an athlete? Are they a good daughter or a good son? Are they responsible? Are they likable? All of these things come out in conversations that they bring to you. So that's why you have to be careful when you're listening and you're digesting and responding. Remember that you are also helping to develop their identity. How you respond to them in those moments is helping them to develop an identity. Are they likable? Do you love them unconditionally? All of those things are in between the lines in your conversations with them. So think about next time your kids come to you for something, which one are they wanting to have? What type of conversation are they looking for? And meet them where they are. And then you can guide them to the practical to do conversation, which is what us as parents, we typically want to get to that, right? We've got to figure out a solution. We've got to fix it. And when you do get to that conversation, the to do the practical one, make sure you're taking them along for the ride on the problem solving. They should help to solve their own problems, to come up with solutions. You can guide them to that space, but when you do that, you are doing such a good thing for their identity. 
and you are helping them to learn how to problem solve for the future. Okay, is this resonating with everyone? I hope. I hope this is feeling like it's practical. Um, I really want you all to, you know, feel like this is something that is useful. Walk away from this into the summer, having some other tools as you could just spend more time with your kids um, to be able to have these great conversations. All right, conversation tools. Again, we're going to get into some other really specifics here. Okay, the tools. Let's talk about these. One of the things that you can do to keep the lines of communication open is to ask questions. Now this one, while it seems easy, is actually really hard. You don't want to have questions in interrogation style, meaning if they come home from school, you don't just say like, who did you sit with at lunch? How did it go? How was the test? How did that? You, know, you don't want to do that. They need time to decompress, just like you do when you walk in the front door. So it's not interrogation style. And the other thing that's really great is to not ask super personal questions at first anyway, because sometimes kids don't want to talk about themselves. So ask some questions that are much more general, a little less personal, like you, know, you can ask, how was your day today? That's a little broad and most kids don't really even know how to answer that. But you can say like, what did you have for lunch? That's not super personal, unless you're judgmental or you've been on their case about eating, and that's a whole different thing, but something very simple, right? Um, also ask about current events, things that you know that they know about and that maybe they're curious about. Again, it's not personal, so you're just having conversation, you know, words flowing back and forth. That's not about anything that you want from them or that you expect from them. You're not trying to get them to do something. It's just a conversation. And you can also hear their opinion, see how they're seeing the world, which is very exciting and also very scary sometimes, but you wanna know how they're thinking about things. Especially if you have kids who are on the internet, who are on social media, you do not necessarily know everything that they're seeing or hearing or reading. So it's great to have these kind of generalized conversations. Now, the other thing that's important, if you have a kid who doesn't talk a lot, the kid who's like, I don't know, I don't know, today was fine, it was great, you can't get anything out of them, I have a super weapon for you. What you're going to do is you're going to research things that they like, the things that they are passionate about, that they love, and that's going to start conversations. When my daughter was younger, she loved Justin Bieber. I mean, he's okay, I, I like his music, there's good, bad, whatever. But what I would do is I would go and research what he was up to. And as some of you probably know, he was up to no good sometimes. He was up to you know making great music sometimes, but it gave us conversations to have. What was the latest thing that he had done? Or what was the biggest song that he had, had just released? So for you, it might be something like um, Fortnite. It might be Minecraft. It might be Taylor Swift. It might be the robotics club. But do this when you bring it up to your children, the things that they love, do it without judgment. I know there's stuff that they do that you're not excited about. Maybe it's um, singer songwriters that their music is not so great. It might be that they spend tons of time on video games and you're not on board with that but get excited about that with them and have them be the expert because when they get to be the expert, that is really exciting for them, builds up their confidence, their self-esteem, and you get to have this great conversation and connect with them. I'd love to know in the um, chat box, what are the things that your kids are into? Maybe you're not into them, but maybe, maybe you are. Is it basketball? Is it Pokemon cards? Um, is it, TikTok influencer. Oh my gosh, that's that's a hard one to get behind, but even that can be a great way to connect. One second, I'm just going to look at the comments here. <clears throat> Any tips to know which kind of conversation the kid is trying to do? Mm, that's a good question. You really have to listen, right? That first part of it, listen, digest, respond. When you listen, you can kind of get a feel for where they're going. If you're not sure and you're going into the practical and they're saying no to everything you're saying, 
that's a good indicator. That's not the conversation they're having. If you start talking about emotions and all of that, and they're like, mm, then maybe that's not the conversation that they want. So there's no checkbox to say, oh, now I know they're doing this. And you just have to really listen, 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 digest, and figure that out. All right. Um, Someone's asking about what do you do as parents if your teen is found with vape? That is a whole big one. I'll, I will get to that. Don't let me forget to answer that one. Um, Disney and Taylor Swift, Fortnite 24 7, volleyball, Pokemon, Roblox, tennis, SCP, uh, Minecraft, YouTube gamers, video game, basketball, makeup, singers, music, Olivia Rodrigo. So many great things, right? Like some of these, I know they might be like, oh my gosh, there's too much of it. But you guys have some great things you can you can um, start a conversation with. Video games, ask them if they'll teach you how to play a video game. Make them an expert. All right. Okay, next thing is casual. Keep it casual, especially if you're going to have some big conversations. Um, if you're going to have a conversation about sex, which none of us really want to have that, but sometimes we got to talk about these things, right? You don't want to say to them, um, we're going to meet at six o'clock on Friday in the living room, talk about sex. You will not find them anywhere. <laughs> They're going to be nowhere to be found if you're announcing there's this meeting. The other thing, even if you're just saying, hey, we're going to have a meeting, come meet me, let's have a chat six o'clock on Friday. They're going to be going through their mind spiraling. What is this conversation about? So you don't want to do that. It's going to scare them. So what you do instead is capture a moment, a very casual moment to talk about things. This can be when you're walking the dog, can be having dinner, driving down the road. There is comfort for your kids when it's not like all eyes on them, when they're like to the side of you and it's more casual. And if you have kids who don't like to talk a lot, this is a, another good time you can get them to talk when it's not about let's sit down and have a conversation. It's about, hey, let's go do something you like and we're gonna happen to talk along the way. There was one time one of my kids was clearly having a horrific day. I could see it in the emotions and the, the body language, but didn't want to talk about it. So we played a card game in three minutes and everything came out because it became not such a tense conversation. It became a connection and then we were able to chat about it. So when I do private coaching, for instance, I will do a lot of coloring, watercolor, um, games kind of stuff. And that lets the teens talk to me while we're doing something else. It really helps to get the emotions flowing, get the words flowing. So definitely use this, especially over the summer. All right, and let's talk about eye contact. You do not need to require eye contact from your kids in order for them to be listening to you. Uh, watch the rest of their body language in order to see if they are paying attention to you or not. Especially this is true if you're having a difficult conversation, whether it's about sex, whether it's about dating, it's about vaping, it's about they did something wrong. It's okay if they're not looking at you. I like to think of it like if I had to have some difficult conversation at work with HR about some sexual um, harassment or something, if I had to describe something, I wouldn't want to be looking my boss in the eyes and telling them about this. It's the same with our kids. If it's something that's intense, something that's difficult, they may not want to look at you in the eyes and that's okay. All right, these last two are super important. All of this is important, but this is super important. Okay, minimize lectures. I'm gonna say maximize conversations and minimize lectures. If your kid gets a lecture every time they come to you, every time they make a poor choice, every time they just want to tell you about their day, they're going to stop bringing things to you. I know this from the many, many years, many hours of coaching that I've done that many kids will tell me, I don't talk to my parents because they just lecture me. And they can actually list like the top three lectures that their parents give. I actually love hearing those lectures. It's actually really fun. But um, they are hearing those lectures, but it just stop, it's a disconnection instead of a connection when they're being talked at instead of having a conversation. And there's actually some research that shows that when we start to lecture our kids, that after about three sentences, they tune out. 
I asked one of my clients about this. I asked her if that was true and she started laughing. She said, actually, it's like three words when she tunes out because she knows the rest of the lecture. So we just have to kind of take some stock. Is that how we are? Are you lecturing? Are you, is that kind of your normal parenting mode? Just remember you can get that connection without a lecture try asking questions and connecting instead. So minimize lectures and maximize conversations. Okay, and this is the last conversation pointer here. This is suspend judgment. This one is not an easy one as a parent. Um, we really have to stop judging our kids all the time and instead listen to them and support them and try to see the world through their eyes understand their perspective of what they're going through. Are you gonna think some judgy thoughts? Absolutely. Keep those to yourself, let them be in your head, but don't verbalize them. I'm not asking you to all of a sudden not have these thoughts because that means you would be not human anymore, right? But this is really important. I wanna give you an actual like scenario that that that's not gonna happen to you, but could happen. This is just a kind of an extreme example, so. Um, let's say that your daughter comes to you, she's in eighth grade, and she says that one of her classmates is pregnant. I know gasp and everything, but this does happen. It has happened in our district even. So your response might be, that's horrible. Her life is ruined. Doesn't she know about birth control? Where are her parents in all of this? That makes me so mad that her parents allowed this to happen. If that is your reaction, because I would say that's a reaction, not a response. What are you telling your daughter? Is this going to give her the feeling that you're going to be able to support her through thick and thin? No, you've just said to her that the parents aren't great parents. Like there's no compassion. Like her life would be like messed up, ruined at that point. You pointed out the stupidity of this girl. You blame the parents. So what you've done in that situation is you've said to your daughter, do not come to me with anything big like this because I'm not going to be supportive. I'm going to be judgy, judge, judge. So in this situation, what do you do, right? You need to say something. This is a moment of deep connection that you can have when your daughter brings something big to you like this. So I want you to think when you're responding in those situations, how would you want your daughter to feel? How would you want her to be supported in that situation? So it might be something like, that's gotta be really tough for her to deal with that. That's a lot for someone at her age. What a big deal. Her parents, they I hope that they really help her out on this. They are probably shaken up too. Hopefully she gets the support she needs. Do you have any questions about this? So you see, you take down the judge, you take down the reaction and you have a very purposeful response. And in this situation, I would even follow up and say, you know, I bet there's going to be people gossiping about this and talking really bad about her. And I hope that you don't do that because she deserves to be supported. So suspending the judgment allows us to tap into what is our purpose in parenting? What do we want our kids to learn from us? But sometimes it takes those moments to digest it first so we can respond. Okay, one second. I just want to look at. Da -da. Okay. All right. I've got a couple questions I will make sure to answer. Don't worry. All right. I do want to I do want to answer this question because I get this question a lot. And what do you do when your child has attitude? <laughs> when your child's being disrespectful, saying hurtful things, saying no, how do you stay calm in those moments? How do you stick with us, listen, digest, and respond? And I'm gonna give you another simple formula in a not so simple time. When you use this formula, it simplifies it. The first thing you have to do is stay calm. If your child says, I hate you, it can be really easy to get super reactive to that. But understand, they're not saying, I hate you. They're either saying, I hate your rules, or they're saying, I am so extremely emotionally overwhelmed, I don't know what else to say. So stay calm. There's gonna be lots of thoughts going on in your head, that's okay. 
do whatever that thing is that you've decided to do, whether it's clench your fist a few times, take a few deep breaths, but you're going to stay calm. The next thing you're going to do is respond. It is important to role model that when someone treats you disrespectfully, that you stand your ground and you set a boundary. So you say something very short and sweet, like, I don't deserve to be spoken to like that. And you could say something like, um, that really hurt my feelings, or it seems like you're really upset right now. So something that's a response, but it is very measured and it's very calm. What would we naturally want to say if our kid yells at us and is disrespectful? Go to your room. You can't talk to me like that. You start to yell. You start to be disrespectful. That's not what we want to role model for our kids. So you want to stay calm and set the rules for how you're going to be treated and then move on. So don't hold a grudge all day. Don't stop talking to your kids. Don't um, overreact. Don't tell them, okay, I'm taking your phone now. I'm taking all of your, your devices. Okay, like you can't have anything. You can't see any friends for six weeks. Don't do that in those moments. If you want to have a consequence, that's absolutely fine. But you're going to do it later when you're calm, when they're calm, and you're going to do it in a very collaborative way with the conversation. Go back around to that behavior. A lot of times when our kids are in an emotionally heightened state and they say things that are not so respectful, they know they messed up. They just don't know how to dig themselves out of that hole. So if we come to them in a very calm way to talk about it later, oftentimes we'll get a sincere apology, but you can talk about it when everybody's calmed down, talk about it a little bit more and set those boundaries. Okay, let me get back to questions. Let me scroll up here a sec. All right, what do we do as parents if your teen is found with vape? All right, we're gonna stick with our basic rules, right? We're gonna stay calm. First of all, that's the most important. Um, we're gonna listen, we're gonna digest and respond. So to listen, obviously they need to be talking. So if let's say the school calls you or let's say you found the vape or a parent tells you about it, um, make sure that this becomes a conversation instead of just you're in trouble. Um, should they have consequences? Yes, but you want the conversation first because you want to support your child to make better choices in the future. I will say as a side note, many kids, many kids are vaping because they see it as a way to um, reduce their anxiety. When I ask kids about it, that's what they say. So don't, don't see it as they're rebelling against you or they're, they're awful kids making poor choices. They're making poor choices, but they're doing it because they're kind of looking for a way to reduce their anxiety. But how do I know that's why kids are doing it? Because I have a conversation with them. So if they, if your kids caught with it at school or, or you caught whatever, whatever the circumstance is, you want to say, okay, so you're vaping. I want to know, like, how did this start? what why are you vaping what are you getting out of it what do you like about it of course i'm letting them answer these questions before i go to the next question but you want to get to the bottom of why and even ask them how does it feel when you vape and they may say it's relaxing it's calming so then you can say okay so i can see that you're there's a positive thing you're getting out of this but we need to figure out a different way for you to have decreased anxiety I'm so glad that you're talking to me about this. Let's figure out together, how can we get this so that you're not continuing to make that choice? So it's collaborative and take those vapes away. They shouldn't keep them, but I will tell you personal experience, you're gonna take them away. They're gonna replenish them, still take them away. That's money, right? They've got it. Every time you take it away, they've got to find another way to get it. So um, it, it, sometimes that feels like some parents will say they're going to get it anyway. I'm just going to let them do it. Nope, absolutely not. You know, it's bad for them. You don't condone it by saying they're going to get it anyway. We could say that with so many things in life. We have to say this is our boundary. This is not allowed because this is not good for you. But don't do it in a punitive way. It's in a collaborative. We're going to work through this together and keep those conversations going. Okay. There's another question here. Let me find it. Okay. How do we address or react to secrets that they share, but
but that is not in line with your morals, like breaking school rules, but afraid it may shut down conversation if you address or confront. Kids seem to averse, seem so averse to any advice. Um, give me, um, I'm not gonna say your name out loud because I wanna keep you anonymous. Are you talking about your child has secrets or your child is telling you a secret about another child? There's a little bit of a difference. I'm gonna answer this as if you're saying you find out a secret about another child. So what you do is don't get judgmental, right? You don't need to be judgmental. Um, you can ask questions about that. What do they think about the choice that this other child is making? Um, do they feel like it's safe? And tell them, thank you for sharing. If it is something that is dangerous, then you can say to them, thank you so much for sharing this is really dangerous and we need to let someone know because your friend is not safe so together we can decide what our next steps are so it's not this oh you shared it with me so i'm never going to tell anybody if you need to share it bring your child along for the ride so to speak let them help you make the decisions but um there's some things we just can't let go if someone's told you basically um you know someone has an eating disorder or someone's self-harming or things like that you've got to do something about it. Okay, follow up is my child had a secret about themselves, harmless, but still not right. Okay, yeah, so if they tell you a secret about themselves and you're kind of like, I don't agree with this, have that conversation. And you have to think about if they, if you don't agree with them, that's, that's okay. We're not going to agree with everything our kids do. If it is against your morals, your values, you have to decide. It's a very tricky situation. You could say, absolutely, I am against what you are telling me, and that is not okay. If it is about their character, you're going to disconnect them in a very, very big way. So sometimes we have to think about if it's not something that's harmful, it's just something that maybe you weren't raised like believing this or um, it wasn't something that you did and when you were raised um, we have to consider listen digest and respond on that is your response going to alienate your child you can tell your values and your morals but you have to really think about how that aligns with a child that is in front of you and what that means for your relationship and for their identity and for their future and your future as a, a family. So you have to really consider those things. I hope that answers that okay. All right, we are almost out of time. Any other questions, you can pop them in the Q&A or you can put them in the chat box for me too. All right, um, not quite hoppy enough yet, but I just wanna ask while we're all still here, if you can put something in the chat box that is something that you can take from tonight and do in your home what can you change up perhaps or maybe it just solidifies something that you're already doing maybe tell me a way that you're going to listen in a bit different way or ask questions in a different way something that stood out that's helpful for me as we kind of wind up knowing um that we're on the same page and know if there's anything i need to add so i would say remember like as you're making your parenting choices Think about the very first thing that we did today together, and that was to stop and reflect on what we needed as kids. No matter what age, what did we need? And if you have a six-year-old, stop and think about your six-year-old self. If you have a 12-year-old, think about your 12-year-old self. This is my uh, a picture of me as 12-year-old. As a 12-year-old, I was into softball, um, and there was lots of things that I needed. Um, I needed that support. I needed to feel unconditionally loved. I needed to feel listened to. And so for you, I want you to think like of your purpose in parenting, jump back to what you needed. And that's going to really help you to make choices. And we're not perfect, right? You're going to have moments where you react, moments where you yell or say something that's not so great. That's okay because you're human. You're going to go back and you're going to role model how to apologize. You're gonna show them what it looks like when you react. This isn't the way I want to parent. I'm so sorry. Let me um, let me change that up. Let's have that conversation again if you're willing. So make amends. And you're gonna be role modeling so much. They're gonna learn so much from you. And they're gonna feel cared about. 
and they're going to feel loved because really in the end, that's what it's all about. So I know we've gone through a lot, but I know there's so much more to go over. So I wanted to give you um, something else you can continue to go on and study more stuff about parenting. And that's about love languages, which I think is extremely, extremely difficult when kids kind of hit puberty because there's so much that's changing. Um, and of course, love languages are important even for um, our younger kids and for people just in our lives, our friends, our our extended family, our parents. So, um, but this in particular is about teens and love languages because it can be very difficult to figure out what their love languages are sometimes, but also how do you give that love language when you're talking about a teen, when you're talking about physical affection, they may not want to hug anymore. If you're talking about a gift, that gets a little bit more dicey. Um, acts of service, it, there's some some ideas of here about in here about why they're kind of pushing those gifts away, but also how you deliver those gifts to teens. So you can pop on and do that as well. All right, okay, everybody. I think we're done for tonight. I'm so impressed with all of you. Thank you for being here. I know it's actually nice weather outside. So um, thanks for spending your time with me. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who have been here throughout the parent chat season, thanks for joining us. It's been a great ride this year and lots of great speakers that we've had. And I look forward to seeing all of you next year. Um, so let me, da, da, da. okay. All right, everybody, I'm gonna wish you a good night. And I will see you next year. Good night, everyone.